Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome everyone to today's webinar, Chaplaincy, Naming the Heart and Soul of Our Profession. This is part two, Wisdom in the Post-Secular, Overcoming Dichotomies in Chaplaincy. I'm Andrew Andrusco, Project Coordinator for Transforming Chaplaincy, and we are delighted you could all join us. Some housekeeping instructions off the top. This webinar is being recorded. You are listening in using your computer speaker system by default and are muted. Should you have any technical questions regarding the audio or visual, please type those into the chat box located in the platform's dashboard. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions for our presenters by typing your questions into the questions box of that same control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation we will collect these and hope to include them during a Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. With that, I'd like to introduce Transforming Chaplaincy former director and current senior advisor, Dr. George Fichette. Hey, Andy, thanks so much. Uh, welcome, friends. We're glad to have you all with us today for, uh, as what Andy said, is the second of a two-part series uh, in which we're kind of talking about naming the heart and soul uh, of the profession of chaplaincy. Uh, as we all know, change is happening all around us, changes in our culture, such as secularization and changes in healthcare. And there are important changes in our own work, <clears throat> such as the development of an outcome-oriented approach to spiritual care. So we wanna kind of use these webinars to think a little bit about what these changes mean for chaplains and for the heart and soul of our profession. And so that's the focus uh, of the webinars um, uh, that we're uh, providing here. Uh, as many of you know, our first webinar was on June 7th and was about chaplaincy and professionalism. And that was recorded and is available on our website. And if you missed it uh, or you want to look at it again, you're welcome to go back and look at it. <clears throat> In that webinar, uh, Niels Dentum, our, our presenter today, led us through a discussion about professionalism. And you know, one of the pros and cons, chaplains sometimes don't like the term professionalism and they're a little uncomfortable with that. And Neil tried to, Neil's tried to help us be a bit more comfortable with that. Um, and, and Neil's also helped us um, to think about um, the values and goals of chaplaincy and how we integrate values and goals in our work. And he's come up with this wonderful tongue twister called labyrinthic purposiveness. Uh, uh, that can uh, be a useful way for chaplains to think about having, uh, thinking about the goals and values that we embody in our professional work. And so um, if you want to hear more about labyrinthic purposiveness, uh, do take a, a look at that first webinar. Today's webinar, uh, as Andy said, is about wisdom in the post-secular and overcoming some of the dichotomies that we have in chaplaincy. Um, so we're going to begin, Niels will uh, share with us uh, some of the ambivalences that uh, we have uh, in our profession that are sometimes framed as dichotomies, um, and, uh, and then he will engage them um, uh, in light of the empirical research that he did with the case study project um, and uh, propose some uh, new ways of thinking uh, about our work, suggesting that in, in chaplaincy, Theory needs to be com com complemented with relational wisdom. Can we hold those two things together? And then particularly, he's going to kind of help us think about um, uh, the post-secular nature of our society and what that means for our uh, embracing ourselves uh, and our work as spiritual professionals. So um, Niels Dentum uh, is an assistant professor at Tilburg University in the Netherlands. Niels also works as a chaplain in a nursing facility. Niels's doctoral research examined professionalism and professional identity in chaplains who participated in the wonderful Dutch case study project. Uh, and we're really delighted to have Niels come back um, and share more about his work. And joining us today is Dagmar Griffa. Uh, uh, we're really delighted to have Dagmar here. Dagmar has developed and directed the spiritual care program at Children's Hospital in LA since 2002. Dagmar was raised in Germany and completed her graduate theological training there and for a while worked as an inner city a, a, a parish in Dortmund in Germany. Dagmar is ordained in the United Church of Christ. She's a certified CP educator. 
She's worked in general hospital settings as well as mental health and hospice, and in her clinical work as well as her research, Dagmar seeks to advance the understanding and practice of interreligious and intercultural care. Dagmar is the author of Encounters for Change, Interreligious Cooperation in the Care of Individuals and Communities, um, and uh, Dagmar has served on the board of directors and chair of the foundation of ACPE, the Standard for Spiritual Care and Education. We're grateful for all your good work on behalf of the profession, Dagmar, and really pleased to have you both here. So uh, with that, um, uh, Niels, let me turn it over to you. Uh, we're looking forward to our conversation today. Thank you, George, for this uh, wonderful introduction, also for recalling the, um, the last webinar. And if you have attended the last webinar, um, I hope you have practiced uh, the tongue breaker. Uh, and if you didn't, uh, um, let me retake a little bit of last last webinar because it's it's a series uh, with the quite ambitious name, naming the heart and soul of our profession. Um, and there's kind of um, already a tension within this title, like thinking about a chaplaincy as a profession. Indeed, sometimes um, raises hesitance among chaplains because they say, "Well, we are not really a profession like others." We are a spiritual practice and should present ourselves like that. So be more about the heart and the soul. Um, uh, well, I would say that if you look at how chaplaincy is organized and how they are you're trained, for example, for a couple of years, uh, you could really say that chaplaincy is a profession. But the question is how to speak of chaplaincy as a profession in a way that does justice to its spiritual nature. So that's that's what this webinar series is about. And indeed, um, last time. Um, uh, I've talked about um, a generic model of professionalism, which has three dimensions, the value orientation, um, and certain expertise, knowledge and skills for which a chaplain is trained, uh, and which is directed at the values and purposes of the profession as a whole. Um, and also a chaplain is uh, positioned in a certain way, embedded in society, but also in a certain organizational context, uh, ideally in such a way that it will um, reinforce the expertise and eventually also reinforce the value orientation. Um, so in the, in the last webinar um, I talked about the value orientation, how it relates to having goals and purposes in chaplaincy and today I'd like to focus more on the expertise of chaplaincy uh, and on the positioning. Uh, and again I'll try to do that in such a way that uh, I'll do justice to the spiritual form of um, uh, chaplain's um, professionalism. Um, I have two, th two theses today, actually. Uh, the first will be that I'll, uh, that I'll argue for uh, relational wisdom as characteristic of chaplain's knowledge, in addition to a more focus on theory, for example, theoretical knowledge. Uh, and the second is that uh, I'll argue that the post-secular is the context in which chaplains try to negotiate their religious or worldview related identity and that there are also um, opportunities within this post-secular context to be on one hand rooted in your own worldview and the other end open to a diversity of worldviews to observe for society. Um, let me start by um, uh, saying something about the expertise uh, of chaplains. Um, it's interesting if you're Talking about chaplain's expertise in, in research, uh, very soon the, uh, the, the words of uh, theory and methods show up. Uh, theory is one way of, of thinking about uh, uh, conceptualizing chaplain's, theory, uh, chaplain's expertise and to say, well, what's their specific niche, their domain? Um, but when we look at some studies, they all observe that chaplains find it very hard to, in practice to connect their theory to the practices they have. So they might be theoretical educated and mostly they're uh, educated at university uh, and trained as a chaplain. At the same time, they find it hard to connect their uh, practice to theories. Um, for example, in a Dutch survey uh, among chaplains, uh, they were asked, well, mention some of the, the theories that are guiding to your practice. Um, and what, about one third didn't mention any theory at all. The question is, how can that be explained? That, that, that kind of, the chaplains are unaccustomed to speaking about the profession in a more theoretical way. 
And I think there might be several explanations. Um, one of the explanations might be that knowledge became implicit over time. So I'll um, say something more about that later. So knowledge was explicit, for example, in one's training, but became implicit over time and as such was became invisible to the chap. Uh, another idea is that there's a kind of presupposed dichotomy, uh, which I often observe in the profession, also in professional literature, uh, dichotomy be uh, between uh, knowledge versus intuition. So the idea that uh, chaplaincy is, e is either based on knowledge or on intuition, and that you have to choose between one or, or both. Um, today, I'll argue that's a false dichotomy. Um, and, the, and the third possible explanation is that theory might not be the adequate notion to fully describe the worldview related or religious knowledge of chaplains. So, of course, you, you can speak about theory of chaplaincy, but might be not sufficient to to fully describe the knowledge involved in chaplains. So let me elaborate on on these explanations. Um, so first, um, can we observe that many chaplains use the, the notion of intuition to describe what they are doing? So if you're asked why did you do this in a certain uh, situation, why did you uh, accompany the client in this way? Um, well, they often say. Well, it was based on my intuition. Um, well, intuition is a very interesting notion, I think. It's not something you should avoid, but there's also something, I think it's, it's like a pitfall of the notion of intuition, and that is that it mystifies kind of the expertise of Japan. So if you if you only use the word intuition to to conceptualize Japan's knowledge, um, it's you kind of reveal, uh, uh, you, you feel, What's, what's actually the, the knowledge of chaplains, and probably you won't convince a manager that, you, for example, uh, but also you cannot easily trans, uh, transmit your, your knowledge or to, to, um, uh, um, to give, uh, give it over to next, to hand it over to next generations of chaplains if you only use the notion of intuition. Um, so um, intuition might be uh, that chaplains had uh, received the knowledge from their initial training uh, and during the, the the first years of working they have kind of merged their uh, that knowledge they have new experiences and also with probably new books or new texts that they have read and also some lessons they've learned from their colleagues and they kind of merge it in in, in their practice but um, as such the, the theories which they had learned are not recognizable anymore so it might be that they say, well, I do, I do not work based on any theory, but th th those theories are part of their intu intuitive knowledge, part of their embodied knowledge, you could say. Well, what's interesting in the case studies project, which I have studied, uh, I've studied uh, chaplain researchers who participated in the, in the case studies project, and they described and analyzed their own practices. And they uh, said, for example, um, after the, the in the case studies project, you analyze it more. It is, is your practice and ground it in theories. But I would usually stay in intuition and experience. So, um, being involved in research helped them to connect their their practice to the, the notions, the theoretical notions which have once learned or were new to them. And what actually happened, what I described is in my PhD dissertation is that um, their embodied knowledge therefore turned into a body of knowledge. Um, so the knowledge became explicit and also as such, it became also more controllable, if you could say it like that. So they were more able to use it more purposely. Um, and also uh, it helps them to make more explicit choices in the uh, accompaniment of uh, clients. So that's what, one of the advantages of making your implicit or intuitive knowledge explicit. Um, another thing is that chaplains do indeed have a theoretical knowledge base, for example, psychological, sociological, theological no knowledge and theories. But I would also say that um, not all of the knowledge of chaplains um, can be regarded really as a theory. So if you're asking chaplains about Theory is also kind of a notion they're not really accustomed to. 
Um, and if you look at what chaplains do, they often make use of, for example, art, uh, music, uh, paintings, uh, poems, uh, religious symbols, religious stories, uh, rituals, all sorts of, you could say, religious knowledge or worldview related knowledge, which is not really a theory. Sometimes, of course, theories are involved, but which is a, a specific sort of knowledge. I would say, um, you could say, that chaplains have theoretical knowledge, but also they have wisdom um, uh, in their backpack, uh, and which they can use and which they do use in the accompaniment of people. So knowledge and wisdom might be a way to speak of the expertise of uh, chaplains. Um, and to zoom a bit, to look a little bit more into um, the idea of, of wisdom, is that um, many professions say, well, yeah, there's a kind of form of practical wisdom, which is, is part of a profession because uh, theories are not, they're too abstract and they have to be applied in a, in a wise manner in a practice. So you need a sort of practical wisdom. Um, and that's what, what Aristotle called phronesis. Uh, in, in the Greek um, philosophy, there are two concepts for, for wisdom. And one of them is phronesis and the other is sophia. Um, and phronesis is about the practical wisdom, it's also about how life is lived in a good way, uh, how to be a good chaplain. And I think much of a chaplaincy is about, is about how to live, for example, with illness and how to live with adversities and how to live with the, yeah, the circumstances in life you find yourself in. So that is a kind of wisdom which is about how to live your life um, and the, the word how is central. But there's also a kind of um, more contemplative form of wisdom, which is Sophia, and which is more uh, about the questions, what is the good life actually about? And how to think about transcend transcendence. And religious and, and other worldviews have thoughts on this, about where to find a good life and how to be a good human being. And what does it mean to be both fragile and, and powerful as, uh, as human being? Uh, and th that's also part of the wisdom chaplains possess. So if they are talking to someone, a client, about uh, illness, I think different than, for example, psychologists, chaplains also have these ideas about the good life, which you can bring into conversation um, with clients. Um, and that's a specific sort of, of wisdom. Um, and if you would ask, well, based on which theory would you, would you act right now, it's hard to say when a certain philosopher has influenced you uh, to mention that as a theory. Um, and the idea of both forms of, of wisdom and combining them, so both Phronesis and Sophia, also helps to connect the intrinsic and extrinsic function of religion. So religion helps in coping, for example, coping with life issues, but also has a kind of end in itself, like reflecting on the transcendent and be contemplative. Um, I think both forms of wisdom um, are essential part of chaplaincy. Um, so the opposition of knowledge and intuition, which is often found, kind of has a positivist uh, uh, premise in which knowledge is seen basically as something well, too technical, um, like medical knowledge, which you just apply like a medicine to a certain, um, uh, uh, to cure someone. And, and uh, um, understandably, chaplains have difficulty in, in uh, understanding their own knowledge in such a technical way. But if you would um, complement the more uh, theoretical knowledge with, with um, a relational knowledge, like, for example, in my own tradition, the Jewish Christian tradition, um, there, there is, for example, the, the Hebrew word yada, which includes various forms of, of knowing. It means both to know and to love. And I think that's, that's a different way of speaking about knowledge, which is not about a technical form of knowledge, but also about um, how to speak and deal with the intimacy of the questions uh, chaplains are talking about. Um, so thinking about chaplaincy's um, uh, expertise, one should definitely also speak of theory and also do research on theory, but also include more like the wisdom of and, and the relational approach of chaplains in thinking about uh, their expertise. So that's that's about chaplains' expertise. Let me now turn to um, that third 
part in the model of professionalism, which is Chaplin's um, positioning. With, and there's also a kind of dichotomy in here. Um, and let me first uh, have two situations. So first there's um, a chaplain uh, on a ward uh, from, of a nursing home and um, he's approaching to a nurse and asking, well, is there any client who might want to speak to me today? Uh, and the chaplain uh, and the nurse says, well, let me think, no, there's no one's dying at the moment and no one's going to church. Um, so both uh, two associations with, uh, which the nurse has with chaplaincy uh, and as in response to that, the chaplain said, well, I'm not here for religious people. I'm here just for everyone. Um, in another situation, chaplain approaches a, a client, um, uh, African client in this case, it's, it's from the case studies project, an example. And they had a really good conversation according to the chaplain. But at the end of the conversation, the chaplain asked, well, is there anything else I can do for you? And kind of unconsciously, uh, the chaplain used the word pastor in this context. And when the word pastor was, was used, a kind of new uh, energy came into the conversation. And um, uh, the, the, the client who was speaking to uh, kind of uh, bumped up and, and said, well, are oh, you a pastor? Well, I'd like to pray. And, and new, new themes came into the conversation. So what you see in both examples is that religion is both kind of an hindrance sometimes for spiritual care and sometimes also it, it's a force as a chaplain to have their role as a chaplain. And this is something uh, very, um, um, I think, characteristic for the plural situation, at least in the Netherlands. And I'm also curious about how you recognize that in the United States, that uh, religion is, can both be a hindrance and an affordance to provide spiritual care. But the idea for chaplains, because they want to be available for everyone, is that those answers also become part of their self-presentation. Uh, um, and um, this is what I call uh, spiritual correctness. So chaplains kind of want to be spiritual correct. Um, it's an equivalent of political correctness. And they're trying to be spiritual neutral, um, just to be sure that they're available to everyone. And the question is, if a chaplain is spiritual neutral, are you really available to everyone? If, 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 if you saw in the first example, in the second example, uh, the chaplain was kind of spiritual neutral, but only once uh, he or she has, uh, uh, had uh, mentioned the notion of pastor, a new conversation started. Um, and there's the dichotomy between spiritual and professional. And, and in order to be available to everyone, religious identity has to be downplayed. Um, this is partly because um, uh, can be explained by some historical developments. Um, for example, society is secularizing. Um, in Netherlands, in a different pace, I think, than in the United States. But this leads to kind of difficulties in legitimation. If less clients are religious, um, they have to account for their work and legitimize themselves in new knowledge and in new words. So it's not sufficient to say, well, I'm just here for the religious people, but also try to legitimate themselves, for example, by showing their added value to the well-being and health of uh, patients or to uh, mental health and mental health care institutions. So they uh, are looking for new ways of legitimation. And research is, is one of the ways in which uh, the new forms of legitimation are found and pursued. Um, but secularization is not just out there, it's also within chaplains themselves, so it affects them as well. One of the um, participants in the case studies project um, uh, said, like, well, it's tough for us chaplains uh, in a secularized society. We do not easily ask about someone's worldview. It's a kind of taboo which we have internalized. Well, those are my words, you don't discuss that. So the chaplain was not a secular chaplain herself, but she, she noticed that she had kind of internalized the idea that you would not talk about someone's religion or worldview in a public sphere, it's because it's very private and intimate. Um, and also chaplains themselves secularize. So they also have the secular voices and new sources of meaning and worldviews within themselves. So they're just not, only within one tradition, but also draw from many traditions sometimes. 
And finally, one of the historical developments which might have influenced Japanese um, in becoming spiritual neutral, neutral is the influence of Carl Rogers' non-directive counseling. So um, the idea that as a Japan you have to be a kind of blank page and you should not guide someone in your own with your own tradition or your own convictions. So that might have reinforced chaplains to downplay or at least not discuss their own worldview identity or position. Well, interestingly, interestingly in the case studies project, um, several chaplains became aware of the role of their uh, worldview in their work and they, they noticed that it played a bigger role than they initially thought. Um, and when asked in a survey among the, the participants in the case studies project, uh, when I asked them if they experienced any difference in their insight in how their norms and values affected their practice, uh, the majority indicated an increase, and uh, about a third indicated it had remained equal, and for 13% it had increased largely. So for many chaplains, it had increased their, their insight in how their knowledge and their, how their norms and their values uh, kind of unconsciously uh, affected the way they were a chaplain, the way they accompanied people, perhaps even if they did not explicitly talk about religious issues. Um, so, um, I think the idea, like I said before, um, of the dichotomy between um, being available to everyone and having a uh, religious or worldview related identity is a kind of false dichotomy. I think the notion of the post-secular helps to uh, um, um, nuance this dichotomy. The idea of the post-secular, it's, it's, there are many conceptions of the post-secular, but what it, it actually does is it um, basically offers a critique on the distinction between uh, a religious and secular as both separate domains. Um, and also they have a critique on the view of both uh, society as a, for example, Christian society, but also critique on the idea that society is a secular society. Um, and the, although the, the notion of the post kind of presupposes a, a more temporal notion, like first you had a kind of Christian society or religious society, and then there was the secular society, and now we're in the post-secular, so we overcome kind of secularism. That's not really, I think, how you should look at the post-secular. I would propose that it's more like um, a, 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 a spatial concept. So like you have both religious and secular voices at the same time in the public sphere in society. Um, they're both simultaneously manifest and chaplains have to negotiate their identity, but not only their identity, they have to uh, be able to accompany people from multiple um, voices and from multiple positions within this landscape of the post-secular. Um, and if this is the case uh, that society is fundamentally plural, I think um, it should not be expected from chaplains to speak a neutral language, but rather to learn to speak multiple languages. So to speak, of course, the language from your own tradition, but also languages from other traditions. Um, and I think Dabo Grave, I will not uh, um, uh, elaborate on that, but has, has also written about that, how you have multiple roles you can play. You can, for example, if someone's really not religious and you doesn't see you like a spiritual uh, advisor, you can be a general chaplain to say, but also you can speak to someone from a different tradition, but still on a spiritual level. You can also sp speak from within a tradition with a certain authority. So there, there are multiple um, roles you can play and multiple languages you can speak. And so I would say no spiritual neutrality, but spiritual multilinguality, also another tongue breaker <laughs> to practice <laughs> if you want to. Um, the idea of post-secular um, space um, can also be applied to chaplaincy as a profession, because I think chaplaincy in public space of, of um, healthcare institution, but also in prisons and the military, uh, can be studied as a, as a case study of how post-secular society lives together and how they find meaning and how they discuss meaning. And um, uh, I think it's very interesting to study that um, because chaplains are mostly 
uh, rooted in a certain worldview, but speak with clients from a variety of worldview backgrounds. Um, I will say it's not only that the post-secular is, again, out there, it's also that there are religious and non-religious voices manifest within the chaplain themselves. So, for example, as a Christian chaplain, you can perhaps sometimes feel more acquainted with a humanist client than with someone from within your own tradition. So there, um, the idea of thinking in, in fixed boxes of, of a worldview is kind of misguiding, I think, because, yeah, of course, there's a Christian client, so we send a Christian chaplain. is not necessarily a good match. They do not necessarily understand each other. It might be better to speak some from a different tradition. Um, we, we might be even closer, or not closer, but just better able to understand what a client's, um, a client's view on life is. So the idea of the post-secular also problematizes the um, distinction between inside and outside religions. And what might be helpful, and I think there's an interesting uh, symbol, uh, is not asking can, what kind of worldview are you affiliated to? Because then people often uh, mention a kind of official affiliation. Um, there's the idea of the worldview map. So to say, well, where do you stand on this worldview map? Uh, and how does your, how do you look at life from the position you, you you're taking in? Um, and then it's more fluid and also more dynamic and also not in notions like secular or religious, but it's more on a substantive level. Like, how do you look at life? What's important for you? What values do you have? Um, and how does it play a role in the situation you're in right now? And the chaplain can also then be open about his or her own position on the worldview map. And then as a chaplain and a client, you relate to each other. So the idea of the post-secular, I would say, um, um, if you do not share um, the knowledge of uh, and the, the, the worldview position with your clients, can you still use something and speak from the inside of your own tradition? That's something I've also struggled with in my research. Can I, as a Christian theologian, also say something from the theological tradition I'm in about chaplains who do not affiliate with that tradition? And I think there's the idea of third order justifications, which might be very inspiring. Uh, it's based on Rawls' idea of first and second order justifications. Uh, the uh, philosopher Rawls thought, well, there are first order justifications which you can use when you're sharing the norms and values within a certain tradition. So, for example, within the Buddhist tradition, you speak with other Buddhists and try to agree, and you use arguments which are valid within your tradition. But when you come, for example, to the political domain, those arguments, Buddhist arguments, for example, might not be valid for society as a whole. So you're trying to look for arguments, more general language, general arguments, which are evident to society as a whole, and which is mostly less religiously rooted. Well, the Dutch, Dutch humanist philosopher Heidi Kuhneman mentions a third option, who says, well, you can also share something from a religious tradition or a worldview tradition not based on its authority, like it's an argument which has authority for someone else, but because of its evocative power. So you mention a story or you, you tell a story or you, you use a symbol from your own tradition, which is not shared by your conversation partner, but still might have an evocative power in that situation, which might clarify the understanding, uh, clarify the situation for the client or might be helpful. So it's not based on authority, but it's based on its evocative power. And of course, it has to be used in a very prudent way. But um, I think this idea of the third order justifications might enable chaplains to speak and to use their traditions also in situations in which they're encountering someone not from their own tradition. So let me um, um, complete the pr presentation for now. So to summarize, uh, we have uh, looked at those two form, two dimensions of the model of professionalism, the expertise, which I will say theory is not sufficient to describe what chaplaincy's expertise is about. We also need to speak about wisdom and to write about it, uh, and also speaking about the position 
it's important to see chaplaincy as a, um, a profession which is positioned and situated in a post-secular society, uh, which enables them to speak from their own language, but also uh, kind of ask them to, to learn multiple languages, to, to be a good chaplain in a plural society. So, um, those are some of my reflections I would like to share with you today. Very much looking forward to uh, Dagmar's questions in the, the discussion we can have, uh, and also from the uh, from the audience. Thank you for uh, for this so far. Niels, thanks so much for such a rich conversation. Dagmar, uh, what have you been thinking? Thank you. First of all, um, I want to you know share that I've really appreciated um not only your presentation i've i've read a little bit in your dissertation and um what in your conclusion i think you talked about um sort of like the soul of chaplaincy is serving vulnerable clients with issues of meaning and worldview uh which very much comes out in this pr uh, presentation and i think you you mentioned chaplaincy as one of the, uh, one of the most beautiful professions and I think that that um, deep appreciation for the profession and your commitment to map a path and as we move forward in professionalization really shows um, and I've really appreciated that um, and also um, your attempts to overcome these dichotomies that I think we hear in our field sometimes I think sometimes they're more in our in our heads than actually uh, that they're existing. We kind of make these either or distinctions between science and humanities, between secular and religious, theory, knowledge and intuition. And I really appreciate that in your work you're trying to move beyond this either or binary thinking and maybe come to a both and in some ways and, and sort of like the, the partnership or the dialogue of these. Um, so that's you know starting out that's one one of the appreciations that i have uh kind of becoming more familiar with your work niels and then there are two things that have sort of like caught my attention um in a particular way and so i'm gonna point these out and maybe we can engage in a dialogue around that or um one was, you know, I think um, your idea of relational knowledge um, or Sophia, in addition to phronesis, is, is, uh, is a wonderful bridge uh, that I think can describe uh, the nature of chaplaincy. And um, when you mentioned that, um, you know, you had sort of like the, those feet hanging in the air, that sometimes chaplains struggle to anchor their interventions in, in theory or to maybe articulate what guides them. I've I've noticed that I'm I'm a you know CPE educator and I we have residents now and I've I um I just notice often that we spend like really a whole unit on you know helping to articulate uh, whether it's in chart note and communications with uh the other team members, um, what guides our interventions or how do we even talk about our assessments? And so, um, and I think, you know, those things are important in order to be intelligible in our world, but also in terms of moving our own, you know, looking with a self-critical eye or with accountability to what we're doing. And so I'm just wondering sometimes if as educators in academia or in CPE, could there be something different? You know, I kind of, you mentioned that somewhere, um, you know, academic preparation helps us to get steeped in worldview and our own tradition. Um, there's a little bit sometimes of sociology, psychology, and then there's CPE, which emphasizes self-integration. And I kind of almost feel like there's this this box in between uh, that would help us to link, to have a better link of you know this relational knowledge and and some of the theories. And what what would that you know what might that look like? Uh, how can we 
flesh that out a little more that we help kind of feel like maybe there's something in education that we can do to help students or, or chaplains articulate their work more. Um, so that was that this is one question that was, you know, and sparked by sparked by your uh, reflections. And then the other one was, uh, I really appreciated your, um, you know, description of the post secular space, especially again, as something overcoming a dichotomy and saying, yeah, there is secular and diverse religious uh, worldviews in in our society. People have, you know, uh, describe, you know, um, live with both. And um, I'm from Germany, and I think in in some ways it's a little similar to the Dutch context, and that there's a lot of uh, secularism has grown. Um, Right now I'm working in, in LA and we have a great diversity also in our hospital. And so one of the things that I've always been struggling with is um, I've appreciated how you said that, you know, don't let's not throw out your world, our own worldview or our worldview expertise um, in our training and becoming neutral because I think that's, I've really appreciated that um, I, I really think that is the soul, as you say, of our profession to deal with issues of meaning and uh, for vulnerable uh, patients. Um, but in terms of the relationships, like, I, I agree we need to learn like multiple languages. And um, one of the things that I often deal with is the how we relate with different people of different uh, uh, religious traditions because you know we have some, especially from the Christian tradition we're often you know representing sort of like the colonizing part the dominating part of um, you know how worldviews have been used or like um, I'm thinking that in our hospital sometimes I think you know religion even if I try to be neutral oftentimes the association with religion is as the oppressing group um, and so we have even as we look for maybe a shared knowledge within professional chaplaincy how can we be sure that chaplains from minority that right now are in minority traditions like Jewish, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist that um, we really have a shared shared knowledge and not you know certain dominating views culturally or religiously so that's that's one of the things that I also struggle with and would be curious to hear your thoughts maybe even from your context in the Netherlands so yeah yeah well thank you Dagmar first of all for your appreciative words but also for the questions which I think help in also deepening and further elaborating my own thoughts uh, on these issues mm -hmm. um, first say something about uh, I, I agree with you that education might play a, um, a major role in helping chaplains um, connecting their theory and practices. Um, it, it might be on several ways, several levels. Um, if you, for example, speak of academia, I think it's also important to, to help chaplains reflect on the theories and how they apply theories within their practices also within academia. So we are now developing uh, a two years master's program um, in, uh, in Tilburg University, uh, mm -hmm. University. And, and there we try to really use both forms like a, a continuous uh, iteration between theory and practice so in mm -hmm. order to not only see theory as something which is um, fixed and then you, you take it into practice but as something which is continuously in conversation with practice also within chaplains themselves. So to really uh, and also to help them uh, it's more like research literacy, literacy to help them to find theories uh, in order when they experience uh, a new situation in their practice once they're working that they know a way to help to be curiously and to search for new theories new articles to understand what they are encountering in practice so also to have this academic academic attitude I would say um, mm -hmm. me speaking about CPE um, I think there's also that way from below because often there are lots of knowledge and theories but unarticulated 
or not yet developed into a theory, but something which is just developed as knowledge in practice, uh, a practice theory, you would say, of a chaplain uh, him or herself. And um, reflecting on that might help to articulate that specific knowledge and also perhaps to build it into a theory. And um, one of the, uh, what I would say, it might be a pitfall of, of, of only um, paying attention to more the integrate personal integration in CPE. Yeah. Uh, I would say we could complement it with a more um, reflection on the profession and sometimes not only on the professional, but also on what can we learn about the profession in this specific situation. I would say both are, ne are needed. Mm -hmm. um, um, but also recently, um, one of the teams in the hospital in the Netherlands started to work with a kind of supervision model, which is not only about their personal learning process, but also about what do we learn about um, how we work as chaplains in this specific situation. And I think that might also help to, to be more accustomed to thinking in a theoretical way about one's work. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's about the first question. So I continue with the second, or do we want to respond um, have a conversation? Uh, maybe just briefly how um, yeah. I very much, uh, resonate with you know what you said about uh um you know i'm i'm a cpe supervisor and i i see more and more and i think we have evolved our own curriculum much more into an understanding of the profession um and and from the self integration which of course is important so definitely agree with that and also that maybe what I hear you say is that maybe even in the academic preparation and in, in CPE, um, it's it's uh, to learn how to develop and to continuously engage in reflection and, and, and see your development as a chaplain. So sounds very yeah. appreciated. Yeah, yeah, oh, great, great, great. And when it comes to your second, um, question about um, the perspective from, for, ex for example, the colonizing uh, traditions and how do you um, uh, account for the power there are sometimes in those mm -hmm. uh, relations and how do you deal with diversity? I think, first of all, my idea of the third order justifications is not something how can we still um, uh, uh, talk from our own tradition, but it's, re it's, it's really um, derives from a situation in which chaplains do not speak about the tradition anymore because they feel uh, hesitant and they feel like kind of uh, well it's uh, i cannot um uh, i have to respect to the difference in in relation so they're very much sensitive to the power approach and due to the sensitivity they do not speak from the tradition anymore so i would say there's first sensitivity about the power you have but mm -hmm. still then there might be a way to speak from your own tradition, but be sensitive about it. And I think the idea of the worldview map might also help to make it explicit in a conversation. So not to think, well, sometimes someone is perhaps from a different tradition, let's not talk about it. Or perhaps they think um, I'm from a religious tradition, they uh, um, let, let's just do not talk about it in this conversation because it's it, then, it might reinforce the, 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 the power relations. Um, I think just be open about it and renegotiate it and to see uh, where someone stands is also kind of a form of acknowledging that someone's not within your tradition. And that's something uh, kind of really basic uh, element, a basic condition to have a good conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see George uh, popping up, George. <laughs> Um, yeah, I don't, want to cut off the, I don't want to cut off the conversation, Dagmar, if there was more you wanted to say. No, if there are questions, please. Let's yeah. go ahead. Well, just actually speaking of the worldview map, somebody said, where did you get that worldview map? Can you tell us where we can find it? <clears throat> but, you know, I was also, when you showed us the worldview map, I was thinking, I, again, rather than thinking about a kind of linear historical kind of progression, you know, from a kind of Christian worldview to a secular worldview to post-secular, but rather the fact that they're all together. And and the map actually allows uh, also for this notion of journey, doesn't it? That uh, yeah. I'm not I'm not fixed in one worldview. I'm actually sometimes, mm -hmm. sometimes people are, but other times people are actually exploring worldviews. Uh, they're journeying from one to another. 
uh, and and so the the, mo the notion of the map actually uh, allows for that. Um, but I, I actually, the the other thing that occurred to me is uh, is your kind of uh, reference to the Kuhneman uh, third order um, uh, justification uh, about the evocative nature of a religious tradition or a worldview that might not be uh, the client's worldview, uh, but it might be useful to them because it actually helps them think about their situation in a new way. And it led me to think about, um, and you know, the notion of multiple languages, it led me to think about the challenges chaplains face when the donor shows up, Dagmar, this is uh, uh, evoked by having been with you, when the donor shows up and says, I have some money, let's build a new chapel. Um, and, and so how, what do you think about what should a chapel look like in a modern um, uh, healthcare facility in a, in a post-secular world? And it, it made me think, thinking that question, actually thinking about having been with you uh, at your hospital a number of years ago, Dagmar, and the tour you gave me of your beautiful chapel and the mm -hmm. kind of thought that went into creating that, right? I mean, so when you think about that as a representative task uh, for chaplains functioning um, in a post-secular way, right? Um, I don't know whether or not any more thoughts about that or what that brings up. Yeah, I could just briefly mention, um, uh, it's actually, you know, when we developed our chapel, we um, are inter it's an interface center, we recognized that a neutral space, you know, would not work. So in, in that sense, it's very much uh, in line with what Niels, men you know, mentioned, because we have, uh, you know, if you have a neutral space, many of our Latino Catholic patients would not find any meaning there because Our Lady of Guadalupe is not there, and that's our busiest corner, you know. And uh, but at the same time, if you have a very prominent uh, figure image in one room, our Muslim patients have trouble because you can't depict, you know, any you know people or animals in a in a sacred space, and so we have these little alcoves. So in, in a way we have this post-secular space where there's one neutral room that has nature images. And then we have like a little Lady of Guadalupe, Christian, otherwise Christian, Jewish, Muslim, Buddhist, Hindu alcove. And they're all open, they're not really closed, but they have their own spaces, um, which, which is a little bit maybe what what you describe in the post secular space. So yeah, it's interesting to hear. Also, that those are not closed spaces, so right. uh, they are in a way connected to each other, and people from different traditions might meet each other in the hallway or or in, mm -hmm. the, in the space of the of the of the room itself. So I think that's. Um, something really uh, like an image of, the, of how the post-secular would look like in, in such a room. Yeah. And I, I think just to come back one more thing, like the fluidity that you mentioned, actually, I think, and with a worldview map, I think that's a very interesting space. I think we deal with both and maybe more organizationally with our identities, but when it comes to the encounter itself, there is a lot more fluidity, I believe. Um, uh like you know just start out with the issues that that connect you know is it you know i'm suffering yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. really the core piece not i'm christian yeah. i'm catholic or whatever mm -hmm. yeah yeah no so they, of course you can be part of a community of people and that's something which is often less fluid um but the beliefs and convictions and values you have they were very much fluid uh, and like george said also, they can change over time, and you can migrate through the uh, through the uh, the worldview map. Um, and also, you can see, for example, that you're close to a border to another country. Yeah. So you close to to the border of another worldview, and you might feel very much like uh, affiliated. You you almost speak uh, speak the same language. It's, it's just a dialect. So um, I think the idea of the the map really um, yeah really helps to see fluidity um, instead of the, you know, the more fixed sociological idea of uh, different uh, separate worldviews. Uh, and the map, by the way, <laughs> uh, is, is about uh, is from a, um, 
uh, kind of atlas uh, in the Netherlands. It's also translated in English. I'm not sure how it's called in English, but it's it's really about kind of the inner world of people. And there are many more maps. It's really fascinating. You should look for it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in Dutch, it's called uh, Atlas uh, Atlas of uh, of the the world of the experience. I think it's also similar uh, phrase in, in English. So if you look at uh, it at Google, it might be interesting to uh, to look into it. You, you could also use it in conversations with clients sometimes. I, I sometimes use it. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, maybe we have a minute for one or two of the questions that have come in. Uh, Carrie uh, says, um, uh, she was in another webinar where the presenter said that uh, the issues that we face are actually the supply of chaplains and that we need to focus on uh, um, um, providing, uh, getting more people into the profession rather than the training uh, the, uh, of chaplains. Uh, we need to, <clears throat> um, the demand of chaplains is higher than the supply. What are your thoughts about this, especially with the changing landscape of beliefs? Um, Yes, maybe you first, Dagmar, if you have a thought. Um, well, it's something you should you should seriously, of course, acknowledge. I'm not sure how the supply of chaplains is, a, is an issue in the United States, but I think from the from the perspective of a profession, I think the value orientation of a chap of, of profession is essentially uh, what care, what is what's the best. So the question is, how can you best pursue those values? Is that by for example, uh, letting in more chaplains who are less trained, or by having less chaplains who are better trained. So I can have can have a general answer, but I think you should um, look at the values you want to to strive for, and not just the number of chaplains or the number of people whose met are uh, whose needs are are met. Yeah. Mm -hmm. think that one? It Thoughts? might be uh, another either or that we don't have to go to. Um, that's true. Um, just looking at it from a practical standpoint, um, when I just look at jobs, uh, you know, my chap it's not like my chaplains get, you know, that are trained get right away jobs. So I'm not sure. Um, I think there are a lot of places where we would have as chaplains work to do. We have work to do. I don't know when it comes to actually jobs, how you know how strong the need is but i you know i'm only speaking from a very limited experience so yeah. in my field here in california well it might be interesting is that in the netherlands we just normally you would have a three-year master program to become a chaplain mm -hmm. and we're not trying to do it also in two years so that to, to lower the threshold to become a chaplain but still to try to guarantee kind of basic quality and to see the chaplains have to have a basic quality to start but then they can of course uh, continue the training over time so that might also be a way to to get more people into the profession uh, yeah. yeah one of the other questions comes from darren darren's kind of saying can you say more about what you mean by the word theory uh, i think uh, kind of uh, the, the question i take it actually kind of represents the fact that uh, chaplains are not trained um, with a strong kind of set of theories. As uh, Dagmar said, our training here in the US really focuses on self-awareness and interpersonal effectiveness. And, and so it, for many of us, the word theory is pretty strange. And um, are there, <laughs> what, <laughs> what does a theory look like? How would we know if we actually have one? <clears throat> yeah, it's also, it's hard to define exactly what a theory is, but I would say um, a theory is something is, is a kind of well. Not, let me not give a kind of abstract definition, but it's it's like um, uh, a set of ideas with a certain coherence, which tries to explain a certain phenomena in the world. So, for example, uh, um, a theory about how people find meaning after. Uh, being ill within the Christian tradition. So it's, it's a theory that tries to explain what happens to people when they are in certain situations, and perhaps also theories which um, argue for what are effective ways of um, coping or uh, uh, um, caring for people in those situations. So I think those theories are often supported by research, uh, also by empirical research, can be 
uh, um, tested in a certain way um, and then they're not just just false they try to explain and to um, yeah um, perhaps also prescribe and can prescribe how to act in a certain situation and um, to, to mention what one of the theories which is in the, in the Netherlands is the Ars Moriendi model, model it's, which has five uh, key elements uh, kind of struggles people have when they are come into a, a process of dying and the, such a theory helps to understand people and they're in the process of dying and also helps to to see what you can do as a chaplain so i would say i hope it's a bit clear but that would be a theory yeah it, um you know i was about to get into conversation about this and examples of theories and talking about theories and i looked at the clock and i said oh my gosh the time is up um uh, so uh thank you so much uh niels for sharing your work with us over the last two webinars kind of helping us think about ourselves and our professional work and the elements of our profession and the kind of ways we get ourselves stuck in dichotomies that might not be um, really as fixed as we think they are and for introducing us to labyrinthic purposiveness and uh, yada uh, and for post-secular ways of uh, thinking about our identity. Uh, Dagmar, I appreciate uh, you joining us for the conversation and sharing your wisdom. Friends, we hope it's been helpful. Uh, the webinar uh, for all of those who were registered uh, will be posted uh, on the website um, in the next few days. And we look forward to continuing these conversations in the coming months. Uh, uh, best to everyone as you work to strengthen uh, the good spiritual care you do and uh, your professional identities. Appreciate it all. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks so much, Niels. It was great. Yeah, you're welcome, George. I also liked it. We'll stay in touch. You stay in touch. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay.